Hi, I'm Kathy Johnson, uh, and welcome to Town Talk. Uh, I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, we're going to talk about something that is a favorite subject for me, and I'm sure many of you out there in, uh, that are watching, horses. If anybody out there understands, once you've connected with a horse, you never forget that connection. And so I'm going to introduce you to uh, Maggie Buck. And Maggie, would you like to tell uh, our listening audience a little something about yourself? Sure. I'm Maggie Buck. Um, I own Kettle Drum Farm in Southbury, Connecticut. Uh -huh. um, we're a boarding and lesson facility, and we take care of 16 horses at the time. Um, at, our capacity is 25. Um, we have a couple of nice barns, and we have a very large um, indoor riding arena. And we're currently having our outdoor riding arena redone with brand new sand and footing. And so we're so excited about it. Oh, that's great when you're doing improvements. Yes, yes. And um, we've been able to do quite a few at the farm. Um, we've put in a fair amount of new paddocks. So we have a lot of paddock space, a lot of more grass paddocks, which the horses like. Mm -hmm. And this last year, we also um, installed solar panels at our farm. Um, really? Yes. On, on the barn or on, on the... one of the barns? Oh. It has some um, southern exposure, and um, it was a way of kind of uh, evening out some of our cost on the farm. Right. But we also like the fact that on those hot, sunny days that um, are hard to get other things done on the farm because of the heat, at least I know we're making electricity. Oh, that, 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 that's great. Now, uh, how long have you been involved with horses and the farm? I, I know the well, name. It's been there a long time. The, the horses themselves, I got my first horse as a middle-aged adult. Um, oh. I got her in 1991, and I ended up buying the horse farm in 2004. So we've been there just short of 12 years. Um, we bought it in October. It was actually an unexpected um, purchase, Right. but I don't regret it. I really love running the farm. I love the horses. I like what I've learned over the years about taking care of horses, and... Um, it's just an animal. You know, you love horses. I've yes. always loved them. Yes. And, and you know, it's interesting because we do have this one thing in common. Uh, you know, I used to ask Santa Claus every year for a pony, and I never got one. On my 32nd birthday, while my husband was out on a business trip, I, a barn opened up in Oxford uh, on 67, which is Haynes's barn now. But at that time, it was the riding stable. I went over there to get a quart of milk from the shopping center and came home from the barn with a horse. Literally, I, I mean, I picked a horse, I bought it, middle age, well, 32 years old, and uh, of course I had the vet come out, but that's how I got my first horse, an 18-year-old flea bit gray uh, gelding. But anyway, continue, that's what we have in common, and so it's never too late to start, right? No, no, um, I had ridden a little bit as a kid. Right. Um, in Michigan, that's where I'm born. Right. Um, but when I moved to Connecticut, I found it to be expensive. I lived in an area that didn't have a lot of barns. I'd ride every now and then. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but not steadily. And then when um, I moved to Oxford, I moved to Oxford um, in 86 with the intention of eventually having uh, my own horse. And, and I eventually did buy a horse. And I had her for quite a while. Right. I bought her as an older horse. Um, 17, 18, and I right. had her until she was 34. Right. Um, great little horse, nice horse for someone to have as their first horse. Um, our second horse came along somewhat unexpectedly because when, um, when I had uh, Autumn, my first horse, she got moved to a barn where there was another horse that wasn't being ridden, wasn't being handled, and was actually becoming kind of wild. Mm -hmm. And I started riding him and retraining him, mm -hmm. and I eventually adopted him. Oh. And then the um, purchase of the farm kind of got sealed because my, um, my husband, who never rode, never rode before he met me. So his first ride was at age like 38, got on his horse for the first time, um, went riding with me once on the beach. And he didn't get her, and it didn't become a huge problem, but you could see that if he was going to keep riding with me, he had to learn at least some minimum basics of riding. Right. Um, in his case, he had gone to the beach with new boots, new riding boots. Oh. 
and shoved them into his stirrups and he couldn't get them out. So when he had a problem with the horse, he couldn't get his feet out of the stirrups. Oh, no. And you know, you've ridden before. Yes. That's like a very dangerous situation. It, it certainly is. And I told him afterwards, I said, that's it. If you're going to ride with me, even if it's casual riding, you have to learn at least the basics so I know that you're going to be safe. Right. And so he went to what is Kettle Drum Farm and started taking some lessons and then promptly bought his horse that he was riding there. Oh, that's that that, that that's wonderful. And you know, three months later, we bought the whole farm. <laughs> oh my goodness! You know that that's a that is a great story, and I think it's very uplifting for people to know that you can start riding at any age, and that, that you know that. Uh, and I like the idea that you mentioned that it was an older horse, your first horse. Uh, uh, I, I've always felt that people who have been to stables and go out with the horses, come back with the horses, and they think they can ride, and they decide they want a beautiful young horse or this or that, and they think they're just going to get up and ride, and it's going to be like you went to the riding stable. Not, not necessarily so, huh? No, it isn't. Um, but sometimes I tell people that, you know, that a lot of times in our society, we, we've gotten very accustomed to other pets in our life. Right. And we've gotten ac accustomed to cats and dogs and other various pets, and a lot of people get them young, um, and train them. Mm -hmm. And even if they're not perhaps the greatest of dog trainers or cat trainers or whatever other pet trainers, those are smaller animals and it's easier to have them live with you and live in your space and adjust to them and they adjust to you. I mean, obviously there are situations where animals don't adjust and, you mm -hmm. know, unfortunately those are animals that end up in our shelters. Mm -hmm. But those are smaller animals. Your likelihood of getting hurt is substantially different. Mm -hmm. With a horse, there is a lot to learning how to handle a horse. And horses, um, people have a way of viewing them as um, they're this big, beautiful animal. Right. And they are a big, beautiful animal. Their temperaments, though, can be entirely different That's from true. one to another, from age to age, and from horse to horse. Mm -hmm. So... Can you get a young horse that's untrained and have it grow up with you and become an excellent animal? I would say the chances it's possible. It's not out of the realm of possibility, but it is unlikely. That's true. Um, especially if you've been riding at a riding stable and you've been riding school horses. That's right. School horses are generally picked for being calm animals, not spooking, and also tolerating a large a variety of rider signals and rider behavior. Right. So they will filter out a lot of behavior that the human has that another horse might not be quite as forgiving about or another horse might get confused about. Um, we have a number of school horses that you can ask them multiple ways to do things and they'll try to figure it out. Right. If you don't get what you want, they're most likely going to walk or stop and the instructor is going to have to give you more cues as to this is what to do with the horse. But they're very unlikely to get rattled by it and decide that they need to get away from you or That's to right. drop you on the ground or anything like that. So I do advise people that, um, first of all, to learn a little bit about horses, ride horses first, and also learn how to take care of them. That's right. It gives you a great deal of knowledge. It's not all about your saddle time and what you're going to do with that animal when you're riding it. It's also about how you're going to handle it on the ground and handle it in a way that's not going to get you hurt and not going to get the horse hurt. Yes, you know, and, and Maggie, to dovetail off of that, starting from the ground first is a very good idea. Starting to learn your animal, touch touch the animal, talk to them, um, become a oneness with that horse. Uh, uh, I, I think one of the first things I did when I trained my yearling uh, was uh, to also read about how a horse thinks and, 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 and a mind of a horse. Uh, can you elaborate a little on that? I, I can. And actually, there's, it, it's, um, horses are a great subject because you're always learning. Oh, yeah. You don't, it, nobody ever knows everything it, about a horse. It, not That's everybody always agrees on everything, but there are, there are some, some fairly standard things. And there are some things that um, we like to reinforce to people who haven't been around horses or haven't been around mm -hmm. them lately. Um, one of the, the biggest things I've noticed with people when they encounter a horse is that a lot of people, for whatever reason, are tempted to reach out and touch that horse on the nose. Oh, I know. And they don't understand is that a horse's field of vision is entirely different than ours. 
very our good eyes point. are in front of our face we have very good vision in front of our face once like if you were to open your arms up from in front of your face when your arms get out to your sides you you've lost your your vision right and you have that big blind spot behind yes you. well a horse's eyes are set on the side of his face so a horse has very good vision forward but not immediately in front of his face right and he also doesn't have really good vision behind his behind mm -hmm. they have excellent excellent vision all the way down their side mm -hmm. so when somebody comes into the barn and they're walking up to that horse that horse can see him as perhaps as they enter the barn but as they get closer that ho that human disappears to the horse mm -hmm. and so if they suddenly touch him on the end of his nose that person has come out of their blind spot yes and touched him in a vulnerable way now a very calm school horse is most likely been touched that way by the last 20 kids won't that have ridden him won't and care. won't care and he won't care he's learned to kind of half be half asleep and listen to the kids and mm -hmm. who's behind them and mm -hmm. you know do we tell the kids and the adult riders not to touch them in the behind without letting them know that you're there we right. do right but have I ever had a horse kick it at somebody no but would I go up especially to a young horse and do that no no <laughs> No, and you would you would be right along the side, side touching it, touching it, and then it. moving close to the back if you yeah. Eat it, so and that you can, knew, yeah. you can even use your voice to let your them know voice, yeah. where you're going, yes. and just let them know. And um, so that is is one thing. One of the other things about how horses think and um, feel about things that surprises people is that when you're riding them, they can. Um, there's certain things a horse will remember and some things they don't. Yes. And people sometimes can be like, why doesn't my horse remember this? Mm -hmm. This particular command or this mm -hmm. particular... Mm -hmm. Well, that horse may have not made the correct association. With that. Yeah. With that. That when you bump your leg this way, this is what you want him to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they may have a hard time remembering that. Mm -hmm. um, they're much more likely, though, to remember what made a connection to them and that might be something that may seem totally some silly to us. Um, years and years ago, when I had my first mare, I used to do a lot of trail riding. Mm -hmm. And she was a great little trail horse, very rarely spooked at anything. A butterfly came out of the weeds one time and it caught her eye. A butterfly. A butterfly. Scared the life out of her. Even though she's a big animal, she doesn't know that she's a big animal. It surprised her. It moved in an unexpected way. Now... She remembered that butterfly, and for weeks I used to have to watch that she wouldn't spook on me in that same spot. In that spot. same spot. She made the connection between being afraid At that and that butterfly in that spot. And you and I both know, because we've worked with horses, you more so than I, but I do know this, that you have to be very, very careful in your training because horses don't easily forget those the bad things. No, you, they if, don't. If something bad goes wrong, if you've allowed a situation that has spooked that horse, it's going to take. It's good when you train them because then they remember. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're re reinforcing that. But having a good memory like that, I found, was also work against you if you were a novice and didn't do the right thing. You know, I I I I, that, I learned that. Um, the other thing that people. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I rode horses for a long time and until I really started taking care of so many horses, right. did not really realize how low level your body language has to be to talk to a horse. That's exactly right. It, and they, people, actually most humans to a horse were shouting at them. Oh yeah. It's, it's, they talk in very little nuances of their body. And it's through repeated horse contact and horse handling that you kind of learn a little bit about, well, if I move myself this way, I'm telling the horse, hey, get out of my space. Right. Um, and it can be funny little things for like with young riders and kids sometimes that if they're lacking confidence and they're walking with their shoulders rounded and they're looking at the ground, it tells the horse that the horse is in charge. Right. And sometimes they tell them, you know what, you need to fool the horse a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to fool them 100%, but you need to fool them a little bit. So I want you to, like, pick your shoulders up, and I want you to look up and look where you're going. Right. And and ask that horse to go along with you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, they're quiet school horses, and they'll go with the flow. 
Well, you know, that brings something to mind of a book I read, uh, Writing Out of Your Mind. Uh, it, it's amazing, and I guess a lot of athletes use this. You actually imagine where you're going, how you're going to do it, uh, what is going to happen. You imagine yourself working with that horse calmly. You imagine yourself that, and it almost is as if the horse picks up on that mental. Because you're teaching that low-level body language and confidence. That's where you're picking it up, and yeah. that horse can read it. That horse can read it across the barnyard. That's right. So, yes, that's one of the other aspects. Um, also, I think it's very important for some people, even if they're not going to take care of horses mm -hmm. all the time, it's, it's not a job for everybody. Um, there are times when it's cold and hot and dirty and it's and not wet fun to and, do, right. And, um, well, I, I love it, so I, I, I can't say if I... If the weather's bad, let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah, if you're freezing, yeah. But I think it's always helpful to have an understanding of, of the animal, why it lives the way it lives. Um, because then if you're going to ever become a horse owner, you can make better choices for your animal. Right. Um, there are certain things that humans can develop an idea of what they think it should look like that in their horse care. Yeah. What the look should look like. Right. And the look that they're usually looking for is that perfectly clean horse and that perfectly clean stall with very deep bedding with right. its head out of the stall waiting for its owner. Right. It's a beautiful, idyllic look. Right. It's not what the horse is looking for. No, not realistic at all, is that it? That horse would actually like to spend a good portion of its day. It had, not that it doesn't like its human. Most of our horses can't wait for their humans to come and take them out and ride them and pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. That's their time with their mm -hmm. owner, and they love it. Mm -hmm. But the rest of their time, they don't want to stay in a stall by themselves. They want to be out. They want to be outside. Even in the bad weather, even, even in the in, snow. Yes. yes. They love it. Yes, they do. Um, they like to be out, and to varying degrees, depending on the horse, they want companionship. They're a herd animal. They want to be with the herd. Right. Now, does that mean we take all of our horses and turn them all out in one big field? We don't. They have a pecking order. Mm -hmm. They fight. Right. They'll argue. To the extent that some of them will get along, we've got, for example, we've got one field where we have five geldings. Mm -hmm. There's a little hierarchy of who's in charge, but right. in their hierarchy, they don't fight. Mm -hmm. They don't kick each other. Right. They do push each other around, though, sometimes. Sure. That sure. dominant horse will go sure, and Sure, you'll have your alpha every horse there. Five yeah. piles of hay to find the one that he thinks he wants, and all those horses will move off that pile of hay because he's in charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they would rather live in that little group and spend their day together. And yet, if you remove one of those horses and bring another one in, that whole dynamic can changes. changes. It could change, it could stay the same alpha horse if he's still there, but it, the dynamic changes. Uh, just like when you uh, invite someone else into your home for a yes. week, uh, the dynamics the change. change, yes. But now, um, other horses um, may be perfectly happy staying in a paddock by themselves mm -hmm. if they're particularly aggressive and mm -hmm. want to kick or bite mm -hmm. another horse. Um, would they prefer that horse be in the paddock with them? Mm -hmm. Probably. Mm -hmm. But as humans, we don't want them kicking and biting each other. No, that's and right. Injuring each other. Mm -hmm. But they may be very content long as there's a horse over the fence that they can talk to or another horse they can see. Right, right. Um, the, the last thing that they want to do is, is stay in the barn by themselves. Yes. Some they horses will accommodate it, but that's years and years of a human telling them that that's what they have to accommodate. Well, one of the things I remember reading when I was training my yearling, which um, just tell the audience a little bit, uh, I, I bought him when he was a year old. He was just about as high as my waist, um, appendix registered quarter horse, a bay. And I went very slowly with him. And uh, one of the things I did was I read an awful lot, and we talked about that. But this brings me to something where we're talking about understanding the mind of a horse and their body, all, all what we're talking about here and what it means to groom the horse and all. Two things come to mind. One is that, that, that uh, saying, I had a book of poems when I was a little girl about a book of all about horses. And one of the things was, and I know you've probably heard this, there's something about the outside of a horse that's good for the inside of a man. Uh, that was a little saying that I, I had read. And also, the fact that a horse has only two ways to defend themselves. Correct me if I'm wrong, Maggie, because it's been a lot of years. Uh, they're either going to kick what's bothering them, or they're going to flee. 
They do have one other method. Horses What's can it? bite. And they can bite, yes. Yeah. All right. A horse's first MO generally is to flee. Yes. Um, and that's that's their first MO. Generally, when they want to uh, duke it out with somebody is where they feel like they can't flee. Right. Then, then they're going to kick or bite, yeah. <coughs> Most of them, though, it's not like they don't do that without warning. And again, that goes back to your body language, learning to recognize when the horse is stressed, when the horse is upset. Oh, yes. Tell and, us about how we know that. Yeah. Well, a lot of horses exhibit certain body languages. Um, a horse that's totally calm might stand in cross ties. And for those who don't know what cross ties are, there are two ropes that usually go out to fasten to each side of the horse's face in a barn environment mm -hmm. that basically tell the horse to stay in one spot so somebody can groom it and work with it and mm -hmm. saddle it. Mm -hmm. um, some barns do what they call head tying, which is to tie a horse to a, a hitching post or mm -hmm. a stall door. Mm -hmm. um, but m in your bigger barns, it's more common to have cross ties. Um, your better cross ties are, are set up actually to release if the horse gets panicked enough. Because you could have an accident. Because you could that. have an accident. Yes. And so they're generally to tell the horse to stay in one spot. And what you'll see is generally a horse will stay fairly calm in, in cross ties. You might see him pick up one hind hoof and rest the corner of the hoof mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, the tail, unless there's a lot of flies, is usually pretty mm -hmm. calm. Mm -hmm. And the horse just kind of just dozes a little bit there mm -hmm. while, you, while you groom it. When they start flickering their ears a lot, especially if they start flickering their ears, picking up their head, the nose is going up, they're shivering their body, they're stomping their feet. And the last one is, is when that tail, if that tail isn't just swishing flies, but that tail is really stomping the horse's body, that horse is stressed. Yes. And that horse is upset about something, whether it doesn't like to be groomed, doesn't like to be saddled, um, or there's something external that's bothering mm -hmm. flies mm -hmm. or something right. like that. But that's generally the signs you can tell. Now, um, we talked a little before about horses that learn something and they learn it permanently um, from something that's happened to them that's been negative. Right. I have uh, a little gray quarter um, Arab mm -hmm. uh, school horse named Mitchell. Um, for anybody who lives in the Oxford or Southbury area that's ridden at my farm, especially as a young kid, he's a very big favorite of young kids. Very calm, very quiet, very mm -hmm. patient. But Mitchell at one point did in, in, run into an encounter with Lyme disease, oh. which can make horses see funny and think funny. And oh. unfortunately, because he was such a calm horse, we and he was very, he's always been very sound, we didn't have any of the typical signs that would tell you that a horse has Lyme disease. Oh. And a young girl had him in cross ties, and she had thrown the tack on the floor, and she moved very quickly with the horses. We were always constantly like, slow down a little, let the horse know you're there. Mm -hmm. Well, she picked up a saddle pad off the floor and flung it on his back. Well, it startled him, and it scared him, and he went up on his hind legs, and he ended up hitting the roof oh. on our barn. Well, to him, when he got up there, for whatever reason, those cross ties didn't release when they should have. Oh. And he thinks those cross ties bit him. Oh, and, and you never... Gosh. And you know what? We've had a couple of instances where we thought... We, for a while, we had him in one cross tie, and then we thought he'd gotten over it. And then he had a couple scrambly episodes with hooves, not getting hurt, but you could see he was panicked when he found out he was in two of them. Mm -hmm. And now we never put him in two. He's mm -hmm. more than calm to stay on one. In one tie. But in his mind, you put two on. See, that's a perfect example. And, and this is where I used to get frustrated um, with uh, 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 young children and parents that want, wanted them in the barns and all. The, the child has this idea that they've ridden a couple of times in, a, a, in an environment that's a certain horse, a certain way, and then suddenly they really think they know to ride, they th really think they know all about horses, and not at all prepared for all the different little things that a horse can present to you that you need to deal with. Uh, and um, then they buy a horse, take it home, and... <laughs> well, horses, um, horses, even if you're really good in the field, Horses have a way of reminding you that you're a human and they're a horse. Yes. And that maybe you don't quite talk to them in the language that they understand all of the time. And does a human forget that they're dealing with a 1,200-pound animal usually? And that when, if they move or throw their weight, you know, <laughs> you have to watch too, right? Yes. Um, no, I think most people are actually um, fairly 
fairly decent about that. Where oh. people run into, I see more people run into problems is that they can ride a horse and they can ride horses for a long time and get very good results. Right. And then horses, like humans, they have their bad days. Sure they do. They just do. And whether they're, uh, whatever has caused it, it, sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know. And sometimes you'll get a horse that, um, I had a lady riding one of my paint mares the other night. She's a little quirky to ride sometimes. She mm -hmm. likes to give people a hard time. Mm -hmm. Not mean. No, just steering. A little going stubborn. Where they are. A little, a little stubborn. stubborn. Mm -hmm. But last night, she I don't know what, for whatever reason, she just simply wasn't going to do it. And there's times where you can discipline a horse quickly and calmly and firmly and get a horse past an issue like that. But when they get really resistant to it, where they're not totally cued in on the human rider, sometimes it's better just to put them away and, and try and, another day. And try another day. And, um, and I, I would like to say something sure. quick on, on discipline. Sure. Because I think it's, it's one area in the public domain that you get a large variation of opinions. Uh, and I can tell you, I, some of them, I, everybody has a different opinion, and to some extent, I, I understand them. But I would like to just give my opinion, if you don't please, mind. Please, please, Maggie. Because I, I have found with horses that the vast majority of them, it's timing. When you correct them, timing. You've got to be quick. Yes. You don't actually always have to be right. You have to be quick. Right. Um, if they go to nip you or lift a hoof when they shouldn't, a quick little backhand with your hand in a, in a gruff way saying no, they, uh, they usually will tolerate a correction if they think that they've done something to provoke it. Right. Very right. few horses. There, aren't, there are some that will stand their ground. They're not the horse for the average person. person. But most of your horses that are safe for the general public to ride and for the general public to handle, they know they've done something they're not supposed to do, and that little reprimand is usually enough. Right. Um, what horses don't, um, can't deal with because they can't process this is people who want to keep that punishment up for an extended period of time. I unfortunately have been cases where I've witnessed where people, the horse doesn't behave under saddle, doesn't perform the way they want it to. And if the horse is exceptionally um, frisky that day, lunging it might be appropriate to let the horse get That's some exactly energy. That's right exactly before you get but on. But if you do it in a negative punishing way, and you're running that horse for 20 minutes to, quote, teach it a lesson that it has to behave under saddle, they don't think that way. A horse lives in the moment. Your correction has to be in the moment, and then you have to move on. That is 100% right. I'm with you with that, yes. And anybody that's looked at the Lipizzan Stallions and seen the beautiful things that they do uh, in Vienna uh, at the Spanish Riding School, believe me, what you just described the, the negative part you described doesn't happen. This is this is how they do it immediately and and move on. That because most people don't understand how a horse thinks, they haven't bothered to understand the mind of the horse. Now I often also see the other half of that coin, right? Which is people where the horse is telling them, "I'm pushing you around. Right. I'm in your space. Mm -hmm. I'm nipping at you with my teeth. Mm -hmm. I'm picking my hoof up." Mm -hmm. and telling you that, no, you can't clean it. You, you've got to put it down. You've got to stay away from me. And they're not reprimanding the horse quickly, mm -hmm. quietly, mm -hmm. and confidently. Mm -hmm. And that just encourages the horse to keep pushing the limit. Sure. He, he, like, any, like any unruly child, he knows what he can get away, away with. with. Yeah. So, but that's, I did want to bring that up because that's yeah. one area that I see people struggle with. Nobody wants to feel like they're um, abusing their horse. At the same time, you also don't want to allow that horse to take little episodes, little pushing around. Yes. Um, and make it a big thing. Make it a big deal. And uh, sometimes what I do when I have a horse um, that's getting a little pushy mm -hmm. is they actually learn and respond very much to low level pushing them back. Mm -hmm. If you have a horse that's all of a sudden deciding it's in charge, it's going to walk mm -hmm. people around mm -hmm. and do what it wants, is sometimes I'll take that horse and I'll put it on a lead line and I'll get, make it stand in the aisle way, mm -hmm. and then I'll tell you, you have to back up. Mm -hmm. And backing up's a funny thing. Horses know how to do it. They don't particularly like to do it. No. It's a little low-level punishment. Yes. You yeah. didn't behave. I'm going to ask you to walk forward nicely. You didn't do it rightly. You didn't do it correctly. You didn't do it calmly. Okay, you have to back up three steps, four steps. Mm -hmm. Would I back them up 
a hundred yards. No. Not unless they continue to misbehave because mm -hmm. after that first three or four steps, they've forgotten what we're doing. Would you say that my, this comment I'm going to make to you is correct or incorrect? There's a lot of talk about it. Uh, when, I, when I was doing my reading, I always felt that if a horse stops or is giving you a hard time, I would say 95% it's something the rider's doing or not doing correctly. Yes. Um, a lot of times it's not necessarily something that you'd say is terribly, in the signaling is not something the horse is recognizing. Right. Whether the horse has forgotten what that signaling means or mm -hmm. the horse never learned it mm -hmm. or the rider isn't cueing the horse quite right or mm -hmm. the horse is having an off day and just says, you know what, I've, I've ridden horses that were very exacting. If you didn't just push quite right with your seat, you didn't quite close your legs right the way you way they wanted. They stopped. They stopped and they weren't going. Yes, that's it. You're not telling me right, I'm not moving. Another horse might be much more forgiving. Mm -hmm. It might say, you know what? You didn't quite do it right, but you know what? I know you want me to walk. Yeah, because I've I done know, this before yeah, and I've I get it. I've done this before and I get it. And I yeah. know you want me to trot, so I'll trot. Yeah. Oops, you just got off balance. I think I'll stop trotting for you. <laughs> yes, they, especially ones that ha have had children on their back yeah. and, in, and, yeah. and they're, tra they're uh, uh, school <laughs> horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what they so, do. So, Maggie, um, uh, uh, now I know that um, uh, you probably have people who are regulars at the barn. I know you do some classes and you do things like that. Um, are are, are are you up and running for people who want to ride or want to learn about horses or anything? We, we are, and we actually are for any age. Um, oh. We have um, several programs running right now. We do some after-school lessons mm -hmm. with young kids. Mm -hmm. um, we do teach them how to handle the horses, how mm -hmm. to tack their own horse, to ride it, mm -hmm. to untack it. Right. A little bit about horse psychology, how horses think. and. Yeah. For kids that are interested and want to learn more, we have some kids who will come on Saturday or Sunday mornings and spend some time at the barn. Um, if they're very young, they may start actually doing something very simple, like learning how to set up grain, um, empty water buckets, right. the water troughs, right. go fetch a horse, help another child with tacking up a horse, right. things like that. It gives them responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, the, the setting up grain is funny because if they're young kids, it teaches them that math is important. You have to know how much. A quarter of a scoop is not the same as three quarters of a scoop. Right. And it makes a difference. Right. Um, you have to learn how to identify different types of grain. We feed a number of different grains at the farm. Uh, you, 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 you know what to do by the nature of the horse or what's good for that particular animal. I, I don't know much about feeding. Um, actually, we... we We've spent a lot of time um, watching the horses and learning what works um, mm -hmm. because that's another area that um, what works for one horse doesn't always work for another horse. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a horse um, that is an easy keeper. A lot of your quarter horses are. Oh, yeah. Um, they can eat a fairly generic grain as long as it has enough nutrients in it mm -hmm. and a, an ample supply of hay mm -hmm. and water. Water is the, the, the number one essential ingredient in taking care of horses is keeping clean water in front, front of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's one of the harder jobs on the farm to keep oh, up with. Because the water gets messy pretty quick, doesn't it? Gets it gets messy quick in the summertime. It gets drunk down quick. In the wintertime, you have to contend with hoses, frozen hoses, keeping it from freezing. It's a huge commitment, even if you own one horse. It's a huge commitment. Well, that's part of why sometimes I like people to take enough time, even if they come... Some of my, my boarders will come and help me feed horses once in a while. Um, it gives them a lot of insight into how much work it is. Yeah, yeah. How much work it is and also why um, something might be different for their horse. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, you know, it, it would be actually much easier for a horse farm owner if you could segregate all of your barn into equal size stalls give them equal amounts of bedding, equal amounts of hay, equal right. amounts of grain of the same oh, grain. Oh, yes. Because then One you size can tell, fits all, huh? Yes, because it, it is easier for a particular boarder to not feel like they've gotten shorted or, um, or, or and I don't mean to say jip, but it, it's kind of that. Sure, sure. That, you know, it's all fair, it's all above board. Right. Um, but like, I have a little Welch pony that lives at my farm. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's a decent sized pony. He doesn't need the same food requirements as do some of the bigger thoroughbreds. Mm -hmm. um, he gets a very small amount of something called a mineral vitamin protein supplement. 
it looks like rain, and to him it is his grain. Yes. But it's not really. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's formulated just to help um, supplement whatever he's not going to get in his hay. I see. To give him the same kind of grain that I might feed one of the higher power, more nervous animals, um, I would just make him unbelievably round. And that would cause him to have problems with his feet or... Yeah, uh, ponies do that, don't they? They, mm -hmm. they can gain weight very fast. And yeah. even with your larger horses, I have um, horses that are on uh, low starch, low sugar grains mm -hmm. because they have something called insulin resistance. Oh, just Very like similar. Diabe call type it, 2 diabetic. That's the easiest, the yeah. easiest um, way for people to understand it. Right. It's slightly different in a horse. But... But um, unfortunately, it makes it so that horse can't go in one of those nice grass paddocks. Mm -hmm. Too much sugar. Yeah. Too much sugar in the grass. And, 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 and it can cause them irreparable, life-threatening harm to their feet. Right, right. So will I let that horse have a, maybe a snatch of grain when it's going back to its paddock? Yes. But is it allowed to graze on the grass? No. No. No, no. I can't threaten its life that way. Right. At the same time, that particular horse, her pasture mate is an older... Uh, she's an older rescue. She was supposed to be 12. I got her from one of the feed lots. Um, beautiful little gray horse. I was very happy that she didn't die on me. I didn't realize how sick she I was I when I bought her. I think I saw her on, on Facebook. On Facebook. Couple. Gracie. Yeah. Gracie, yes. Gracie came to us severely underweight. Um, I'd never taken in that much of an underweight horse before um, with pneumonia. Oh. But she bounced back. Um, good food. Regular food. In her case, four meals a day. Oh, that's what small she needed. Small meals, four meals a day. Right. Very small meals to feed an underweight horse. Right. The human thing of wanting to put a lot of weight on and fix them right away, you can't do that. Not a good thing, no. The other thing is she's an older animal, and having come, being underweight, very hungry, she doesn't know that she needs to eat small meals, and she needs to eat often, and she needs to eat slowly. So she has to have all of her meals soaked very thoroughly with water because she's choke prone. So if she ingests too much grain and gets it caught in her throat, oh. um, it's a it's a vet call. It's a vet call. Oh, Maggie, see that this is the, the I've never gotten into the feeding or the medical end of a horse. If mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, I always would re rely on the barn owner and mm -hmm. all. You know, but uh, that's that. Well, you, you have to you, really know what you're doing with you, that. You do, you do, and you you should be able to rely on your barn staff to have a good idea when your horse is not feeling well. Sure when something's not right, that's part of taking care of them, is realizing, okay, this horse didn't eat all of her dinner. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. This horse is flat out in the paddock, snoring away. Does it every day. 10.30 <coughs> in the morning, nap time. Winter time, oh, that's when the sun is out. 10.30 in the morning, we're all gonna take a nap. There's usually a guard horse watching, but we're gonna take a nap. But now all of a sudden, I see that one over there and that one's laying down and that one doesn't usually lay down. So I'll watch it. Oh. I might go make it get up. Mm -hmm. Because if it gets back down on the ground and mm -hmm. starts rolling or anything like that, it might be sick. Yeah. So now you have uh, all age groups uh, coming to your barn for lessons, or uh, we d we well, do. Um, well, with one exception, mm -hmm. um, we will allow young kids mm -hmm. um, between the ages of four and seven to come for pony rides. Oh. I I personally don't like to start kids in lessons that young, um, because there are certain things that they're. They'll make progress for a little bit in the beginning because they get used to the horse and there's certain things they can do on a horse. But after a while, they won't make progress because they haven't developed the motor skills necessary to ride. Right. They need a certain amount of core strength in their stomach. Right. They need a certain amount of core strength in their backbone. Right. And um, the ability to know right and left. Right. Very important. I mean, yep. people get it wrong. Even adults get yeah. it wrong. I've gotten it wrong. No, Sometimes left, left. I give the signal wrong, right and left. Nope, I meant the other say. Mm -hmm. But um, a basic concept of that is helpful. Right. Um, so from that age, we have, we have riders, and our oldest rider in the years of owning the farm was a lady who came to us at 78 who had never ridden and wanted to learn how to ride. Oh. She, it did, she learned how to tack up. She got up on the horse. She learned the basics of steering and stopping. She did do a short amount of trotting and decided that at her age, Trotting was not in the picture. Right, but the, the fact that she had the nerve and the will to get she, up on a horse at that age. She did, and, and we, never, um, we never had any accidents with her. Um, she really enjoyed coming to the barn and spending time with the horse. Sure. 
which is something I really encourage people. Um, we are trying to start a new program for particularly for women who are around during the daytime that maybe always wanted to learn to ride. Their kids are in school. They think, you know what, that's a kid's sport. I never learned it when I was a kid. We have a program now where we're opening it up for women to come to the farm, or men. Mm -hmm. we, we don't discriminate. We'll, we'll men, men too, too. sure. Um, but we find primarily women um, to come and to go at their pace to learn how to handle the horse, how to tack the horse up, how to groom it, how to ride it, to kind of give them an opening as to whether or not that's a sport they would like to learn more about. Yeah, that's a fabulous idea. You, uh, When we were chatting just before the show opened, you mentioned that to me, and that's a perfect fit for me. I, I've been having a lot of nostalgia uh, of being around horses, and that would be a perfect opportunity for me. Um, uh, and you know, I'm not. I'm proud of my age. I'll say it. I'm 69 years old, and that would be a wonderful way to still be around a horse, especially just the grooming and the this and that. And if I get the nerve, you know, get up and ride yeah. some. And but also an ability to go at your own pace. At my own pace, and not to feel like that you're you're in a a lesson that um, that you have to make progress right away, or that if you're not coordinated right away. Um, I've yeah. taught a number of older riders. Um, it's a little harder for them. It takes them a little longer sometimes. The muscles don't always cooperate. That's right. But I'm not a young rider myself. I go through times where I, because of taking care of horses, I don't ride all the time. And I'll get up and it's like, oh boy, that muscle just doesn't work the way it, it used to. It doesn't. And, and, and it, people don't realize, but you do use a, 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 a myriad of muscles uh, mm -hmm. to to. To ride a horse, it's not like you're just sitting there. there. Yeah, you, you, it, it, it's uh, um, very interesting. Now, I wanted to ask you a question. Now, we're talking about Kettle Drum Farm. I love the name Kettle Drum. That's that that's wonderful. Uh, and uh, we've been showing your phone number. If anybody uh, is interested in horses, wants to come down and visit your farm, uh, your phone number is there. But would you like to just tell the audience one time what your phone number is if it's not showing uh, yes. up? Yes, my, my number is 203-264-0462. Mm -hmm. Now, normally that would be a home phone number for South Berry area, but it's not. It's actually a cell phone. Okay. Um, there are times that people will get my cell phone that if I'm on the tractor, mm -hmm. if I'm leading horses, I may not pick up because I find it difficult um, to do that. On the tractor, I don't hear the phone mm -hmm. going off, but please feel free to leave me a message. It also has text ability. You can text to that number. Okay. Um, so people want to inquire and they want to leave me a text, I do respond to those too. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Well, that's good. And we're located in a very convenient part of South Berry. Um, for those who know where the State Trooper Station is in South Berry, right. we're about two miles up the hill from the State Trooper. Right. Um, we're also about two miles from Kettletown State Park. Um, I don't think that's where our farm got its name though. Um, I used to think that the last owner of the farm started the name Kettle Drum Farm, and then I had a, a couple stop um, at the farm whose um, parents had owned the property back in the 50s. They were actually the ones to buy it from Ed Sullivan. He did oh. own the farm. He never lived there, but he did own the oh, farm. Oh, you mean the, 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 the comedian? The, the, oh, 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 the uh, host show for, yes. um, uh, yeah, I can't remember show, the, uh, the Ed, Ed Sullivan, Sullivan show. show. The Ed Sullivan Show. Yes, he, where did. Everybody... he owned a number of properties on, on North George's Hill Road in South Berry. Right. And um, this was one of them. They had bought the house from him. And at that time, the farm name because it was a bigger farm then, was Kettle Drum Farm. Kettle Drum Farm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's got a great sounding name. I, I love the name of it, uh, uh, Kettle Drum Farm. Every once in a while, though, um, I'll tell my audience to look up because uh, my husband, Wayne, the engineer, running the show right now, will flash up your name of your farm. And what's the, the street it's on? It's on North George's Hill Road. We're yeah. 116 North George's Hill Road. Right. Um, we're a very friendly farm. Yes. Um, we're also very relaxed and laid back. Um, we do have people from time to time that will board with me or ride with me that do show and go mm -hmm. to shows. Right. Um, so we're not an anti-showing barn, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we're not a barn that if you want to come and you want to just enjoy your horse and ride it, mm -hmm. or you want to come enjoy one of our horses and ride it, mm -hmm. um, that you're going to be told, oh, well, you have to learn this this week because next week we've got you signed up for a horse show. Right. And by the way, you need to buy this clothes and that clothes and those clothes. Yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, there are certain clothes I will tell you that are helpful when you ride a hard hat. You absolutely have to wear one at my farm. And it's a boot, maybe. Huh? In boots. Mm -hmm. From there, riding pants. Mm -hmm. I ride in jeans, but riding pants do make a big difference. Right. From there, everything else is comfort, looks. Whatever. Right. Whatever, you, whatever you choose. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought up atmosphere in barns. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into all the politics of barns. Oh, they have politics. But they <laughs> have a lot of politics. And what I want to, I think I'd like our viewing audience to understand one thing. All barns are not created equal. I mean, you have to decide what your comfort level is going to be. I, I mean, sometimes you can get a barn that is really very much in the rough. Uh, um, I don't know how to put it, but it's not a good atmosphere. Uh, at the barn. Then you can go to the real high-end barns where, as you say, like a show barn or like that, and you might not fit in there either. And um, try to extrapolate on what I'm trying to say. I think ours is um, what you would consider to be like a family-owned barn. We right. have um, the lady who came at 78 to ride. Her daughter started riding and her granddaughter started riding. Um, mm -hmm. They actually bought a horse. Right. Um, he's currently living at the farm, although the granddaughter is now off to college, and I believe that he's going to college with her in the next month. Uh -huh. He'll be back in the spring. Um, but we've had all three generations of, of that family have come to my farm, ridden at the farm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, made friends at the farm. Um, so we try to have a very casual but respectful um, attitude. Um, we, we do like people to be respectful of the fact that there are other boarders there. Right. Um, in things like picking up their stuff after they've left right. and not leaving a mess in the barn and, you know, uh, having ring rolls when we ride. Right. Um, things of that nature. Most of that safety to make sure people don't get hurt. Um, but overall, we try to dis to not, um, we don't look down on any discipline. You find that in some barns, that mm -hmm. if you own this breed of horse, it's not particularly welcomed at that barn. Mm-hmm. They might be a barn that wants to do thoroughbreds and jumping, right. or they might want to be a barn that wants to do right. saddlebreds. Right. We have both. Yeah. We have yeah. both. Um, we've had Western riders, English riders. Um, the one thing we don't do in Western, though, is we don't do cows. <laughs> we don't have any cows. You don't have any, any cutting. Uh, you, you don't no, <laughs> we don't do anything like that, because yeah. that would, re would require infrastructure to go along with that discipline. Sure. So again, now there's an example of somebody that if you want to ride a Western horse and you want to chase cows with it, you Kettle Drum Farm, as much as we might like you and we might like you as a person, we wouldn't be able to see, to meet your needs. That's right. Uh, that's a special situation. Uh, um, y you know, th I, see, I see by talking to you that you it's important that the owner and the person like you that's in charge sets a tone for the barn, a feeling of, uh, uh, of everybody getting along, of being com comrades and respecting one another. That's a very important thing. Now, we're coming down to probably about the last eight minutes of our show, Maggie, so I want to give you an opportunity, uh, if there's anything special you want people to know about Kettle Drum Farm, uh, and anything else that comes to your mind uh, now that you want to get in that's very important that you want the listening audience to know, Go ahead now, otherwise we can kick some more horse stuff around, <laughs> because I've got a couple of other things to Well, I think we pretty much covered a lot of the farm. Um, okay. We, I guess I'll just say basically what the farm comprises of. Okay. We have two um, eight-stall barns. Right. We have um, a number of run-in sheds, mm -hmm. so our, our total capacity is about 24, 25 horses. Mm -hmm. I find that when we um, have more than that, we start running into issues um, of the horses not getting along. There's too many people and the horses are too tightly. Horses like space. Yes. Um, we're located in Southbury on 10 acres. Um, we have a nice size riding arena, um, indoor. Indoor? An indoor. Oh, oh yeah, covered arena. Um, it's uh, 150 feet by 90. Wow. So it accommodates um, our lesson program and people coming to ride their horses. We have an outdoor that's slightly narrower but a little bit longer. Um, that by this weekend, hopefully, we'll have a whole new sand footing on it. Mm -hmm. And then we have a small hunt field for people who want to do like low-level eventing. Um, we aren't suitable for high-level eventing. We don't have the room for really high jumps. Right. But for people who want to learn how to um, go over small jumps, two feet jumps and under. In fields. Like in a field. Yeah. Um, we have that. And we have a small walking trail. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we also recently have been taking some of the horses trail riding. Mm-hmm. Um, that's on private land, so we don't know how long that's do going have to be to available. Tra- do you have to transport? Not for that currently, but it's private land, so we don't know how long that's going to be available to us. I see, but uh, you, uh, 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 would someone have to have, if they're boarding their horse, have their own trailer to get to the bridal trail? or That they, they would. We do keep a trailer at the farm. Um, there have been times where we've had boarders that don't have um don't have a trailer and mm-hmm. we've trailered the horses down to the bridal trail mm-hmm. and dropped them off. It's about a 10 minute ride from the farm. Yeah, the bridal trail runs all through that area. In the, in yeah, there's some places that are closer to the barn than the 10 minute ride, but the 10 minute ride is a more um, ideal spot to unload horses and to for people to tack up and get on. And all that. It's a nicer thing. section of the trail right. to ride on. So right. usually what we'll do is we'll trail them over um, to buy the fire um, house in Southbury. Oh, yeah. And that, there's a nice spot there to get on. Yes, yes. And um, uh, and, and it sounds like you have adequate room f- to, to just ride around on the property. And We do. We have a, um, I'm, I used to be a, 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 a really in-depth trail rider. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I used to like to go out by the hour and sometimes we go to bigger parks with my horses mm-hmm. and stuff. So um, it's, it's a matter of semantics and what you think in the horse industry to a dressage horse that spent all of its life living pretty much in a stall, maybe a small paddock, and gone to a riding arena mm-hmm. and worked in an indoor riding mm-hmm. arena. Mm-hmm. What I have available for walking horses out and cooling them out and mm. letting them de-stress is definitely trail riding to them. Oh. Oh, yeah. They go That's... up around the barn and up past the house and down a little dirt road into them. That is definitely a trail ride to them. To me, where I'm used to going out for an hour or two on a horse and and, and stuff. That little trail is not a trail ride to me. That would be my my speed, believe me. <laughs> a lot of people like it. The horses yeah. like it. It's a little yeah. change of pace. It's a little change of pace and all. Um, so yeah, we're, we're glad we have it. Yeah, yeah. But so, I don't, I don't, because I did so much trail riding, I don't build that part of it as a, a, a trail ride. But I do know that a lot of people like to go out there and ride on that little dirt road. Well, we're coming down to the end almost of our show. Five more minutes left. I, I, um, just want to say that I'm so interested in your farm. Uh, uh, I I would I have never visited it. I think it's time that I came over and and visited you. I want you to tell everyone once again your phone number, and I'll ask our engineer to put it up. Uh, Wayne, if you could put that up, uh, how to reach Maggie Buck, Maggie Buck, uh, Southbury Kettle Trump Trum- Kettle Drum Farm, uh, and to reach her is the number is two zero three two six four. 0462, and we'd love to hear from you. Oh, that, that's great, Maggie. Um, I've got another minute or two just to kick a little of my, my thinking about horses around myself. Um, uh, would, I, I, I always stayed away from a thoroughbred horse. I didn't ever think that they're beautiful and they're athletes and they're wonderful, but I've always um, favored a warm blood. In, in, instead of that. Um, uh, we actually have an, a number of um, off-the-track thoroughbreds do fact, you? at the farm. Um, they do have some general um, characteristics that um, I can cover really quickly, but they're not all the same either because they're not all wide-eyed and flighty. They're not all big. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had some fairly small ones. We've got one, the one that's going off to college with the young girl actually mm-hmm. looks more like a quarter horse to most mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Although when he runs, you can see the racehorse in him. Sure, he sure. He likes to go and he likes to be out front. But we also have the king of the pack in the gelding pen is an off-the-track thoroughbred named Anakin. Mm-hmm. And Anakin really is more concerned with being in charge than he is being out front. Oh. So he can run with other horses and stuff, and he doesn't care if he's out front. He mm-hmm. just wants them to know that he's in charge. Oh, I see. He'll pick his spot, and that's it, and he mm-hmm. doesn't mind being at the end nope, or the beginning, nope. and and, that, and that's the way it is. But generally, they are a much more spirited mm-hmm. horse. Mm-hmm. Um, they're much more likely to be more active mm-hmm. than, say, a quarter horse. Mm-hmm. Not that you couldn't get a quarter horse that's got a lot of oomph in it. Sure. Because they can come in that variety, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but for a lot of general horse owners, quarter horses make a nice horse. They have a tendency to be a little calmer, a little smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, stocky, but like any horse, a, a well-bred, well-trained horse, regardless of its breed, is a lovely animal. 
That's right. A poorly bred, poorly fed, or poorly cared for, or poorly or untrained horse doesn't matter what breed it is, it's going to cause you grief. And, and I agree with you, and I think any parent that's watching this or anyone thinking of their first horse, uh, and I, I'll have you correct me if you feel I'm wrong. I've owned horses, and I, I've learned a long time. You don't know everything about a, there You're always learning about a horse. Nobody knows everything. But I would strongly suggest an older horse, a gelding, a warm blood, Something that's already been trained and not something that looks beautiful necessarily right away for the look you want. You know, that would be in my mind. The other thing, and I'll, I know we're, we're, we're on to the end of time, but right. I did want to let people know that, because some people don't know this, in the horse industry, leasing is very often an option. Right. A lot of barns will lease or partially lease their horses out. We do some of that at Kettle Drum. And for kids sometimes or even adults that are going back into riding that think that, okay, the horse you want to start with is maybe not the horse that's going to be the appropriate horse for you six months down the road, a that's year right. down the road, two years down the road. That's right. Buying and selling them requires a great deal of work, effort, money. And nowhere to go. And nowhere to go. So sometimes in those early stages, Leasing. you might want to think you want to, want to own a horse, but you might want to do is you might want to lease a horse and see where your riding skills are going to end up. Because you might want to start, um, I, I have a wonderful large size pony called Ashinkati mm -hmm. from Assateague Island. Wonderful little pony. Um, great little starter animal. Would she be great for a kid that wants to jump three foot fences? No way. No. Now I'm going to ask you to wrap it up there. Tell us uh, your phone number one more time because oh, okay. I'm going to be signing off in a few seconds. We have less than a, a minute. Okay. My phone number again is 203. 264-0462 and you're able to text to that number or call and if you don't get me leave me a message thank yes. you thank you maggie buck kettle drum farm i'll be visiting kettle drum farm and i'm going to ask my audience to be visiting kettle drum farm i think you're going to find it a, a pleasure it was a pleasure to interview maggie and i'm going to um uh, say uh say to everyone uh have a um Good evening and a better tomorrow. I want to say bye from Town Talk.